Welcome to the video for chapter 1.6 on cell division. So you may be tempted to think that cell division is all about mitosis, but you're forgetting about some really important stages in the cell's life cycle. Okay, so to really get into what a cell goes through in its lifetime, we're gonna draw the cell cycle, and I'm gonna start off with a circle here. Okay, now, this cell's life can be represented really in two major parts. Okay, so we have most of the cell's life, all of this stuff in here, and this is what we call interphase. Okay, and then we have this other much smaller part called the M phase. Okay, now, we can kind of use a pie chart type diagram to divide these stages up. And interphase in itself, which you'll notice, again, is most of a cell's life cycle, is split up into three parts. Okay, we'll learn more about these three parts later, but these are the G1, the S, and the G2 phases. Okay, the M phase is kind of split up into two parts called mitosis, which you're probably familiar with, and another part called, holy crap, how am I going to fit this in here, or cytokinesis. Okay, so again, it's important to note that most of the cell's life is spent in interphase, okay, all of this is interphase, only a small portion is spent in the M phase. Okay, so maybe you've heard me say this a few times, and maybe you've already written this down in your notes, but again, cells are gonna spend most of their time in interphase, okay? So if I'm looking at a bunch of cells, it's probably going to uh, hold true for most tissues that most of the cells found within that tissue are in interphase. Okay, this other part, the M phase, is only going to happen every now and then. Now here's another instance of where you need to forget what your seventh grade teacher told you because no, the mitochondria is not the powerhouse of the cell, no, a hypothesis is not an educated guess, and no, interphase is not a resting phase. Cells are not on vacation, getting a suntan and drinking pina coladas, it's not how that works. Okay, cells are actually very active during the interphase, doing their normal cell things. Okay, so cells are performing their designated function. Skin cells are doing skin things, liver cells are doing liver things. Okay, they're producing a lot of proteins because that's what their cells are doing. Okay, I just don't want you to think that all of this time is being spent resting. Mitosis is what gets all of the attention because cool things happen to chromosomes. Okay, but interphase, that period where mitosis isn't actively going on, is not resting, okay? They're doing lots of important things. Now, let's talk about some of those important things, okay? Interphase has three discrete uh, and separate phases of its own, the G1, the S, and the G2. I'm sorry that those aren't in any kind of a logical order. Okay, G1 is the period of cell growth. Cells are gonna grow a little bit, not a ton, because then they become inefficient, okay? Uh, but they're gonna grow a little, and they're gonna perform their normal cell functions, okay? This is a really important part of their life process. When cells start to grow too big, and their surface area to volume ratios start to go down, and they become inefficient, these cells realize that they need to replicate, or maybe they're replicating because they're replacing old cells. Whatever the reason is, when they start to realize that they need to replicate, they're gonna enter this S phase of interphase, and that's where DNA uh, replication is taking place. Why do we call it the S phase? Well, S stands for synthesis. We're synthesizing a new copy of DNA. And then we move into the G2 phase. Okay, G2 is where we're preparing, that's not a word, preparing for cell division. Okay, so one cell 
is going to turn into two cells, and each cell needs all the organelles, the Golgi, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticula, the vacuoles, all those things. Okay, so we got to make sure that there are enough of those for both the old cell and the new cells. Okay, so here is a typical animal cell during interphase. Here's what it looks like in real life. Well, this is a plant cell. I can tell that with a plant cell wall. But what I'm really interested in here is the nucleus. Okay, so if we're drawing an animal cell, we would obviously want to draw this cell membrane here. And what you're not going to see is all of the organelles. Because organelles are present during all phases of the cell's life cycle. You're always going to have Golgi's, you're always going to have ERs, you're always going to have vacuoles. So because those don't change, we don't normally include them in drawings. What we do need to include, however, is an intact nuclear membrane, and that's so important that I'm even going to label it. Okay, so here we have a nuclear membrane. It's intact, doing its thing. And here we're going to have our DNA in the form of what's called chromatin. More on that later. You're also going to notice that these centrioles, okay, are hanging out here near the nucleus. Okay, so they haven't gone anywhere. They're just chilling out right here. Notice this is an animal cell. Okay, they have centrioles. Plants don't have centrioles. Okay, they just have the area known as the centrosomes, okay, but no centrioles. Now, how do we know uh, when a cell is ready to move on through each part of interphase and then through the different parts of mitosis? Well, that's because cells uh, have these things called cyclins. And cyclins, I love them because they are what they sound like they are. They're proteins that regulate a cell's progression through the cell cycle. Okay, so that's where we get that word cyclin. Uh, this ending here, N, is a pretty common ending uh, for some of the proteins that we're going to talk about. So proteins that regulate the cell cycle. And they're basically like a checkpoint, like a border crossing guard. Okay, the cyclins are going to bind to receptors, and those receptors have to be present uh, for a cell to progress through each part of the cell cycle. Okay, so as this cell progresses, okay, it's going to produce a cyclin, and that cyclin and receptor complex has to be present in order for a cell to be able to move to the next part. So it's kind of like a checkpoint. It's going to prevent cells from moving too quickly or from skipping steps or from going through at all. There are some cells, like nerve cells, that lack those cyclins, okay? So they may try to progress, but they won't uh, be able to form these complexes, and then they're always gonna be stuck in here, okay? So that's one of the reasons why nerve cells can't regenerate. They don't have those cyclins present. All right. So let's talk about mitosis. If a cell makes it all the way through those cyclin checkpoints, through interphase, it's going to enter mitosis, where we're talking about uh, the separation or division of what's in the nucleus, the DNA. Okay, At the end of the M phase, or mitosis, we should have two cells that are identical. Each one is going to have a full set of genetic materials plus the organelles that we already replicated during interphase, okay? So here we've got our replicated DNA or genetic material from interphase, and mitosis is all about how that genetic material is going to be split up amongst our two new cells so that they are identical. Now, how do we make sure that all of our DNA makes it into each of our new cells produced by mitosis. You know, this is actually a much harder job than you would think. In each cell, a human cell, you have over six feet of DNA. DNA is an incredibly long, skinny molecule, and like long, skinny molecules, it gets tangled up really easily. So our DNA organizes itself into a very, a tightly coiled structure called chromatin, 
and then even more tightly coiled structures called chromosomes so that they can organize themselves before splitting up. And that organization has some really uh, distinct and noteworthy parts. Okay, so a couple words that you're probably going to be asked to define. Histone. Okay, a histone is a protein around which eukaryotic DNA is wrapped. And we're going to draw this in a little bit. But you're going to notice these eight histone proteins. Okay, the DNA is going to wrap itself around those histone proteins. And that little bundle that kind of looks like what we say beads on a string is called a nucleosome. Okay, a nucleosome is kind of this bundle of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. Okay, now if I string a bunch of these together, I'm going to get what's called chromatin. Chromatin is kind of a loose collection of these nucleosomes, and it's present in the nucleus during interphase. So that's really important. We talked about that earlier. During interphase, DNA is in the form of chromatin, okay, which again is these beads on a string, these nucleosomes. Now, remember. Okay, during the S phase of interphase, we're copying the DNA. So by the time we ever get to mitosis, we've got two copies of all the DNA. That's twice as much DNA to keep track of and make sure that it doesn't get lost or tangled anywhere. So we're going to organize that chromatin when we're getting ready for mitosis into a structure called a chromosome. Okay, and chromosomes have two parts, each called a chromatid and they're held together by a centromere. So let's take a moment to kind of get a solid definition for those words. A chromosome is a condensed and organized version of the replicated DNA, and it is only present during mitosis. Okay, so a condensed and organized version of replicated DNA, only present during mitosis. A chromatid is one half of the chromosome, okay? So here's a chromatid, here's a chromatid. These are our copies, okay? So remember, we copied them during the S phase of interphase. Here's one copy, here's one copy. Each copy is called a chromatid. And they're all held together by a centromere, okay? So a centromere is right here in the middle. Okay, it's going to hold those two chromatids together. It's also going to be where the spindle fibers attach. More on those in just a little bit. All right, so let's do some drawing here. Okay, let's pretend that these are my eight histone proteins. Okay, so here are my histone proteins. Okay, and I'm going to use black here for my DNA. Now DNA, you don't have to draw this part, we know kind of looks like this, okay, like a double helix structure, like a twisted ladder, okay, and that DNA is going to wrap itself kind of around these histone proteins, something like this, okay, so here's some more histone proteins, DNA is going to wrap itself around these histone proteins, and each one of those structures is what we call a nucleosome. Okay, now if I'm going to continue to zoom out, and I forgot to label DNA here, okay, if I continue to zoom out, okay, then I'm going to see a bunch of these nucleosomes kind of all coiled together. Okay, and this is my chromatin. So again, my histone proteins would be somewhere in here, okay, all coiled together with my chromatin. All right, now if this chromatin uh, is in a cell that's getting ready to go through cell division, it is then going to organize itself even further, so the chromatin will wrap up on itself even further. 
and form a chromosome. So here's one half of it, okay, that would be a chromatid. Here's the other half, so the replicated chromatid would also do the same, okay? And here is my chromosome. All right, so let's take a better look at these chromosomes, okay? So I usually draw them like this, something like that. And then I draw another half over here. You know, you need to get into the habit uh, of drawing chromosomes in the correct way. So some people tend to draw chromosomes like this. That is naughty, don't do that. Because when you do that, what you're saying to your brain is that this half is identical to this half. When in reality, you should be drawing them like this. Okay? Because this half is identical to this half. All right, but I digress. So here is a chromosome. So I'll label the whole structure chromosome. Okay, and then this, mm, let's see if it'll let me get rid of these up here. Nope, okay, so this is a chromatid. That's an M, okay? Here would be another chromatid. And sometimes you'll hear them referred to as sister chromatids because this and this, these are identical, okay? So again, we might call those sister chromatids, okay? And it's important to note that this kind of encompasses this whole arm, okay? Not just the top part, but the whole arm there, okay? And then of course they are held together in the middle here. We'll do this. By a centromere. So in this chapter, we're going to focus exclusively on the chromosomes of eukaryotic cells and how they uh, move throughout cell division. But it's worth noting um, that prokaryotic uh, cells have chromosomes too. Actually, they have a single chromosome. Uh, and you should probably know some differences between the two. So prokaryotes have a single loop of DNA. And you're going to notice that there are no histone proteins. On the other hand, eukaryotic chromosomes, remember that DNA is wrapped around those histone proteins to make nucleosomes, which are then supercoiled into chromatin, which are then going to form, of course, these chromosomes that we more uh, often associate uh, with eukaryotic cells. Okay, so here's a quick list of all the things that you should be mentally prepared for. Um, I would be ready to draw cells. I would be ready to identify cells, both in diagrams and micrographs. I would be ready to describe what's going on in each stage. Uh, so kind of like our mental checklist here. Now we've already talked about interphase. So now let's move on to the first phase of mitosis called prophase. Okay, prophase has a couple of really important things uh, that are going to happen. So first of all, we're going to see the chromatin coil into chromosomes, okay? You may also hear this word condense, okay? That means the same thing. So whereas before in the nucleus, we had all of this loose chromatin, okay? Now during prophase, we're going to start to see the appearance of those chromosomes, okay? So that's the first thing. We're also going to see the dissolving of the nuclear membrane. So whereas before we have an intact membrane with only tiny pores in it, okay, now that membrane is going to start to dissolve. We're also going to see the formation of what's called spindle fibers. Spindle fibers originate from the centrosome area, or if you're in an animal cell, these centrioles. And those are going to help move things around uh, later on. Okay, but we're going to see those spindle fibers start to form. 
and the centrosomes, which again, okay, produce the spindle fibers, are starting to move to opposite ends of the poles. So you'll remember that in uh, interphase, they were just kind of clustered up here near the nucleus. Now they're going to start to move on opposite poles. So here's a picture of what might look like in real life. Okay, so we can see this nuclear membrane starting to dissolve, and instead of just a uniform blob of chromatin, we're now seeing these chromosomes start to form. When you're doing your drawing, okay, it's probably going to be best uh, to maybe include a couple key features here. So again, I draw the dotted line here to make sure that I remember that there is a dissolving nuclear membrane. We should see chromosomes start to form. And these centrioles that are producing the spindle fibers are now starting to move to opposite ends of the poles. Okay, so next up is metaphase, and people most often remember metaphase because this is when chromosomes move towards the middle of the cell. Uh, unlucky for you, though, <laughs> IB will never give you an answer choice that sounds like uh, chromosomes move towards the middle. They'll say things like towards the center, towards the equator, something like that, okay? So again, first thing we want to remember is that the chromosomes are moving towards the middle of the cell. And as we're going to find out later, um, we're going to get some movement there in the next stage. <clears throat> and that comes from the attachment of the spindle fibers. So the spindle fibers are kind of like our puppet strings, right? In the next phase, when we need to move these chromosomes, okay, they're only going to be moved if these spindle fibers are attaching. And of course, they're attaching to those centromeres that we drew in the middle of each of those chromosomes. So metaphase. Okay, when you're making your drawing, again, there should be no nuclear membrane. That has completely dissolved by the time we start metaphase, so no nucleus anymore. I'm seeing chromosomes line up in the middle, and I'm seeing these spindle fibers attaching to the centromeres of each chromosome. In real life, we can see that in this plant cell, all of these are these chromosomes lined up here. So this would be like uh, this kind of switching on its side here. And here are all of my chromosomes lined up in the equator or center of the cell. Okay, so next up here is anaphase. And anaphase is when those sister chromatids are pulled apart. So you'll remember that we had two sister chromatids kind of connected by a centromere. And in anaphase, they're starting to get pulled apart. Okay, so the reason why... Um, they look like this shape, like this V shape, is because these spindle fibers are shrinking. They're literally shortening, okay? And it's getting pulled towards opposite ends, okay? So it's kind of changing that shape a little bit. Now, here's the confusing part, right? They were sister chromatids. That's what we called them when they were attached. Now that they're separated, we go back to calling them chromosomes again, <clears throat> Um, that's okay. If that's a little confusing, we can work on that. But the important part to remember here is that they're being pulled towards opposite ends of the poles. Okay. And again, it's worth noting that that movement is due to the shortening of these spindle fibers. Okay. So like our puppet strings here. All right. Um, when you're making your drawing, again, it's important to know there's no nucleus. Okay. These spindle fibers have pulled these chromosomes apart. Okay, in real life, here's a plant cell. Okay, these spider eyelash looking things are our chromosomes and they're getting pulled towards these opposite ends. And then we move on to telophase. Okay, so in telophase now, we're going to have two kind of ends of the cell. I want you to note that the cell is not separate yet. They have not separated. That's something different. Okay, but at each end of the cell, we're going to start to see uh, a complete set of chromosomes because half of them are over here, half of them are over there. Okay, our one replicated set is here, one replicated set is there. The nuclear membrane starts to reform. So I usually draw that, okay, with a dotted line. You can draw a solid line if you want, but our nucleus is coming back. We like that. 
And I, I gotta tell you, I'm not in love with this drawing here <clears throat> because in telophase, these chromosomes really kind of start to uncoil. Okay, so this to me looks like early telophase. By late telophase, all of these chromosomes have uncoiled back into chromatin. So it's up to you how you want to draw it. If you want to draw early telophase, you would be drawing these chromosomes hanging out in here. If you want to draw late telophase, you would be drawing chromatin. Okay, it's up to you just as long as you know um, what's happening there. And then of course our spindle fibers disappear. Okay, we don't need them anymore. Everything is where it should be. All right, so when you're doing your drawing, again, make sure you have one single cell. We have nuclear membranes, okay, and we have all of our genetic material contained in each of those membranes. Here's what that looks like in real life. Again, this to me looks like early telophase because I can still see these chromosomes here. Uh, in late telophase, it's just going to be a blob of chromatin. Okay, so now that we have pretty much two identical cells, we need those cells to physically separate, and that is what we call cytokinesis. Okay, cyto meaning cell, kinesis having to do with movement, so these cells are literally moving apart. And remember, cytokinesis is part of that M phase. So we have all of interphase, and then we have the M phase. Okay, and we just talked about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then here comes cytokinesis, where those cells are actually going to split apart. Now, that's going to look different for animal and plant cells, okay? So in an animal cell, you get what's called a contractile ring that forms around the outside of our cells, okay? So here's those cells at the end of telophase and a contractile ring forms around the outside. That ring starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller and it literally squeezes and pinches those cells apart. So here's what it looks like during cytokinesis and then just after. Okay, so now we have two separate cells. Plant cells are much different. Okay, in plant cells, we're going to see a cell plate. Okay, so in animal cells, we're seeing a ring. In plant cells, we're seeing a cell plate form. And that cell plate is going to grow into the new cell wall that's going to separate them. Okay, so here's what I would draw like while it's undergoing cytokinesis, or maybe this, it doesn't matter. Okay, but here's my plant cell at the end of telophase. Okay, and during cytokinesis, a new cell wall is going to form in between them. Okay, so that now we have two distinct cells. While that cell wall is forming, we call it a cell plate. So really, these two cells aren't as physically separate as these are. Notice there's a gap in between them. It's just like building a wall in between your new neighbor, okay? And that is, again, called the cell plate. Now, cell division sounds all good and well until naughty things start to happen and your cells divide and divide and divide for no apparent reason, okay? And that's what we call a primary tumor. So primary tumor is a mass of cells that are dividing at abnormally fast rates and for no apparent reason. So normally our cells are gonna divide maybe because they're replacing old, dead, or damaged cells. Maybe you're growing and adding cells, okay? That's normal cell division. These cells are just dividing, 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 making new cells, making new cells, making new cells for no gosh darn reason, okay? And that lump of cells is what we call a primary tumor. It's primary because it's like in one spot. Now, this doesn't mean that all tumors are bad. You can have what's called a benign tumor, and benign tumors are examples of primary tumors that are really good at kind of staying in their home, okay? They stay in one spot. When that primary tumor starts to spread to other parts of the body, that's when we get a disease called cancer. Okay, so cancer is the disease that results when the primary tumor starts to spread to other parts of the body. Okay, it can be other organs or it can be other spots in the same organ. Okay, but when that tumor, when that one tumor starts to make a little tumor friends, 
Okay, then we're in trouble. Then we have what's called cancer. And that act of spreading is what we call metastasis. Hard to say, okay? The spreading of cancerous tumor cells through the body, that can happen through the bloodstream like we're seeing in here, or it can happen through like the lymphatic system or any other kind of transport system, okay? But when primary tumor cells break off and then spread to other spots in the body, it's called metastasis and that results in cancer. And those metastasized cells will eventually find a new home and that's what we call a secondary tumor, okay? So a tumor that forms in other parts of the body. So let's say you have a primary tumor in the breast tissue, okay? And that primary tumor starts to metastasize. So some of these naughty cells, okay, make their way through the bloodstream into another organ like the lungs. These would be what we call secondary tumors. Here's the primary tumor. The act of spreading is metastasis, and the overall result is what we call cancer. Now, it's important to note, going back to chapter 1.1, that these breast tissue cells are already differentiated, okay? And any cells that result from them are already differentiated. They're already breast cells. So when they spread to other parts of the body, they don't magically become the cells that are supposed to be there. They don't magically become lung cells. They stay as breast cells. So it's a really interesting uh, kind of connection back there to our chapter on stem cells and cell differentiation. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that cancerous cells or tumor cells are kind of being bad. They're being ulnary and they're dividing when they're not supposed to. But what tells a cell to uh, divide and to not divide, to stay put in interphase or to enter into mitosis. Okay, well, we talked about cyclins, right? Cyclins are those um, protein complexes that kind of allow a cell to pass on from one part of the cell cycle to the other. And those cyclins are controlled by what we call oncogenes. So you may recognize this prefix onco, like oncologist, a doctor who uh, works with cancerous tissues, right? Oncogenes are what tell our cells, hey, I need you to divide, let's produce some cyclins, let's move our butts through this cell cycle and mitosis process, okay? And then once that cell has divided enough times, those oncogenes will know to turn themselves off. Like, hey, we don't need any more copies. Why don't you slow your roll, friend? Okay, we're all good here. Now, these primary tumors start to originate when these oncogenes get all messed up, okay? And they can get messed up by a variety of things. One of those is carcinogens, okay? So, Yes, sometimes tumors can result as a result of a genetic process, like you have a defective gene, you have a mutation, you inherited a mutation. Um, they can also, normal oncogenes can also be mutated by what we call carcinogens, okay? And those are substances that can cause changes to the oncogenes, which in turn uh, doesn't properly tell a cell when it should turn on and turn off that cell division. Okay, so here's kind of how that works. A carcinogen or some kind of genetic mutation causes a change to the oncogene of a cell. So normal oncogenes know when to turn cell division on and off. Naughty, messed up oncogenes tell the cell, hey, this is fun, we should keep on dividing. That malfunctioning oncogene causes the cell to continuously replicate, and that's when we get a primary tumor. Again, if some of these cells were to break off and travel somewhere and land in another part of the body, that would be metastasis, and that would cause a secondary tumor somewhere else, and then we would have cancer. If you were to go on to the American Cancer Society's website and you did a search for possible carcinogens, you would get a list of approximately a million gajillion carcinogens, and most of them have names that I am in no way ever going to try to pronounce and or spell. Okay, so I just kind of pulled a few out uh, that are easy to remember, easy to list, and more importantly for me, easy to spell. Um, cigarette smoke is a big one, and that's, um, again, I should be more specific here talking about tobacco smoke. There are hundreds of potential carcinogens just in tobacco smoke. 
Okay, radiation, like from nuclear reactions or from x-ray machines, those kinds of things. UV rays uh, from the sun or from tanning beds. And of course, there's about a million different kind of toxins, chemicals, pesticides, uh, whatever, asbestos, that can cause changes in those oncogenes. All right, now let's take a look at this really crappy graph. I call it crappy because there's no title, there's no units, okay? I'm not really sure what's going on here, but I can get a good idea that they're plotting cigarettes smoked per day versus lung cancer. Okay, and if you have to describe the relationship between smoking and cancer rates, some of you are going to be tempted to say, well, the more cigarettes you smoke per day, the more you get lung cancer, or cigarettes smoking causes greater incidences in lung cancer. Be very careful. You cannot use this word cause, okay? This is a great example of correlation, not causation. So what we should say is that cigarettes smoked per day are strongly correlated with lung cancer rates. And it appears that smoking more cigarettes per day may be related or may cause higher lung cancer rates, okay? So just be careful. Uh, don't get sucked into that trap there. Now, if we wanted to figure out if cigarette smoking do cause lung cancer rates, we would have to do some kind of a controlled study. Humans are impossible to do that with. Um, there are just too many other factors in their life, in their lifestyles to have a controlled experiment. So we can do that in laboratories. And they have actually done that, okay, exposing some mice to cigarette smoke and some not and kind of measuring their lung cancer incidences. And then if we were looking at data from that, then we could establish a causal relationship, okay? But otherwise, if we're just looking at a graph here, then we have to be very careful to make sure that we say that they're strongly correlated or they may cause it, um, not that they actually cause it. Okay, so one of the things um, that pathologists, um, doctors who study diseases, uh, do and that we're going to do is to calculate and use what's called a mitotic index. And that's a ratio of the number of cells undergoing mitosis compared to the number of cells in interphase or not going through mitosis. So we're going to be taking the number of cells going through mitosis, and that could be any stage, okay, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and we're going to divide that by the total number of cells, okay? So this gives us a ratio of how many cells are undergoing mitosis at any one time. And so why would we do that? What's the point in doing that? Well, because we can use that to figure out if those cells are dividing at the rate that they should. Each tissue undergoes mitosis at different rates, okay? So for example, the layers of your skin, uh, that top layer is constantly going through mitosis, okay? You're getting a new epidermis, the top layer of your skin, about every week. So those cells are undergoing mitosis pretty regularly. For an adult, your bone cells, however, aren't going undergoing mitosis uh, all that often. They don't need a lot of cell replacement. So we can measure the rate of mitosis for different tissues in normal tissue. If we take a, a tissue sample and we calculate the mitotic index and we find that it's higher than it should be for that type of tissue or that type of cells, it can indicate that those cells are tumorous, okay? So if they're undergoing mitosis, more often than they should, that's pretty indicative of a tumor, okay? They're replicating more than they're supposed to. And we can use those mitotic indices to kind of make a prognosis here, okay? So the more your cells are undergoing mitosis, right? The, the faster they're dividing means the more cancer cells are in that tissue sucking up the nutrients and other things when they shouldn't be. Uh, the poorer your prognosis, okay? So the faster your tumor is growing, the higher the mitotic index is, and that means your prognosal prognosis for survival is pretty low, probably looking at a lower survival rate in days. It's one of the ways that um, oncologists and other physicians can kind of give prognoses to cancer patients. 
And on that super happy note, uh, that'll end the video for chapter 1.6.